Hello and thank you for joining me for this workshop. A uh, quick note on the tools and equipment. You don't need all this stuff. You can get away with just some basic measuring equipment and the ingredients. As far as the ingredients go, pretty much any olive oil. Uh, you do need a wheat flour, but you can add other kinds of flours to it. Um, beyond that, the barley malt can be any, you can use any kind of sugar other than honey. All right, what I'm going to show you now is preparing the yeast. Um, this is the first step, and I have pre-measured 7 grams of yeast. This is not the rapid rise yeast. Um, it's just under 3 quarters of a uh, tablespoon. And you can just use packaged yeast. I use it in a jar because it's cheaper. So I pour the yeast in. And I don't measure this. I'm using um, malt extract here. Uh, you can use a little bit of sugar. You need some kind of a sugar because the uh, yeast eats sugar. Um, so I just take a forkful like that. Put that in there. Now this water, as you saw from the photograph, it's at 115 degrees. Um, and though I, I weigh all my ingredients because uh, uh, they change. The, the moisture content of the flour is reflected in the weight of the flour. Obviously water pretty much always weighs what it weighs. It's 115 degrees, which is hotter than you would think. This actually stings a little bit. Temperature isn't dead critical. But once you hit 120 degrees, you kill your yeast. So keeping it below that is good. The higher you can get it, the faster everything's going to work um, up to that 120 degree mark. So you want to stay away from that. I, I'm doing this at 115 degrees. So I'm just going to pour this. This water is all the water we're going to use for the entire loaf. I'm pouring enough in here to just get a little bit of a mix and set the rest aside. Then I'm going to stir until it is pretty well dissolved. There are those who say that you should not rise yeast with, uh, or uh, breed yeast, raise yeast with any kind of metal. This is a stainless steel fork. I've never had any issue um, leaving the fork right in here. I'm kind of lazy when it comes to washing dishes, so. Uh, I, I like to reuse things and clean as I go. That's, that's good enough. So now we're going to let this sit for a while. The time on the clock is 8.20, no, 7.20. It's 7.20 a.m. So we're just going to let this work for a while now. So it's time to go and relax. Take a break. Um, it's just under... So as you can see here, the yeast mixture is uh, pretty much filling a one cup container. Um, one thing I failed to mention before is I said you could use pretty much any sweetener. Do not use honey. Honey um, inhibits the growth of, of uh, funguses, among other things. It's antibacterial, it's antifungal, it's a lot of good things. So don't use honey. But uh, I really like the, the barley malt, and I've had uh, excellent, excellent results with that, and the flavor is, is really nice. So now, I'm just going to take this and mix it down, and pour it right into my flour. And it doesn't pour out very well, it kind of sticks to everything, so I'm going to use my water to rinse. So I'm trying to get all that good yeast, nice live growing stuff into my bread. That is the key to, to nice, light, well-risen bread is, you know, having, having happy yeast and not wasting any of it. So there we go. I've got that pretty well cleaned out. And there's a little bit on the side there. There we go. So that takes care of that.
that. Next, I'm going to pour the rest of my water in. Now, you'll notice I am, have not added the salt yet. Sometimes I add the salt at this point, sometimes I don't. The salt, again, will slow down the yeast. Right now, I just want maximum activation going on. Um, I also still have my olive oil reserved over here. So now, I'm just going to take my fork and I'm going to mix this to what is called a ragged mess. That's a technical term. Believe it or not, a ragged mass, I don't know. I do the same thing when I make pie crusts, but uh, with pie crust, that's pretty much where you stop. With bread, it was just the beginning. So you don't, you're not kneading it, you are not over mixing it. You just want to incorporate the liquid into the dry ingredients, mostly the flour, of course and get that yeast worked in there. Okay, that's it. You see how quick that happened? Now, we're going to let this sit for a half hour. That's it. It's going to work itself. This stage is called hydrolyzing. And um, during this stage, the flour is absorbing water and the yeast is working simultaneously so what's happening is it's going to start developing its own gluten um, it's already started in fact the minute you hit uh, wheat flour with water you've got gluten developing so I don't want this to dry out um, I use these silicone pads I love these for all kinds of things you can actually put these in the oven and bake on them if you want but I'll just cover this up with that and maybe throw a plate on it so that it keeps it sealed and there we go and by the way the clock um, is now 20 minutes to 8 so that took about 20 minutes for my yeast to reach the point where I was uh, ready to add it to the rest of the, uh, the, the dry ingredients All right, we're going to see what this is looking like now. And it uh, should be nice and puffy. And look how much that's changed already. Just sitting there. They've done no work. Now, I'm going to add the oil and the salt, and I am going to do a very light kneading. Um, Shortening is called shortening because it inhibits gluten strand growth. But a uh, little bit of oil in the bread that I make, it, it's just, it's part, it's the way my grandmother did it and probably her mother before her and going back generations. Um, it adds a flavor and a quality to the bread and the crust that uh, you don't get without adding, adding the olive oil. The salt just has to be there. Bread without salt is, ugh. I've forgotten it enough times to know. Um, so the yeast is doing great. Um, this is this is very light. Look at that. See how nicely that, that's alive. That's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to sprinkle the salt in here. And by the way, I use a, um, I use sea salt. Uh, because it has no iodine. Iodine, again, inhibits um, bacterial fungal growth. Um, and we don't want to add antiseptic. This thing's alive, and we want to keep it alive until we kill it deliberately. Um, so now I'm going to add the olive oil. I just pour that around the edges, like so. And again, that's about a, tea, a tablespoon of olive oil. I actually waited. I showed you that in the opening there, but... Um, those aren't, aren't critical things. Uh, what's critical is water to flour. Now I just go around and I work it up from the edges. I try and I hate to waste even a little tiny bit of this because it's just so good. Okay, now the oil is getting underneath. I'm letting it get on my fingers, which makes the stickiness a little easier to handle. 
And when you start this, it's going to be very slimy, um, which is, is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Um, so now I've got the olive oil, see it pretty well incorporated, I mean not incorporated, coated is the right word. So what I'm going to do now is a series of stretch and folds. Okay, and it's, it's not really kneading, although I, I guess this is the closest thing you're going to do to kneading in the whole time. So if, if you need to work out aggression, um, making bread my way is probably not the best choice because this is a very gentle bread making process. So I'm just going to stretch and fold until the sliminess just starts to transition to, um, to a little bit of stickiness. And you can see, I don't know if you can tell, but uh, that bread, that dough has changed dramatically just in the last few seconds. And that's exactly what's supposed to be happening. It's starting to fight back. It's, uh, the gluten is already really well developed there. And uh, we're just, just working the salt and the, uh, and the oil in a little bit. And the dough is actually going to do a lot more of that than we're going to do. So that's, that's pretty good. It's just starting to get a little bit tacky now. And that's really where I want it. And then... There we go. I'm going to cover it back up and we're going to let that sit again for about another half hour. Uh, we came back here at 10 minutes after 8 and it's now about 13 minutes after 8. So that's how much time we just spent there. It's not much. It's break time again. It is now 8.40 a.m. Notice I'm kind of timing things out in half hour increments here. Get these out of the way. Let's have a look. Here's where things start getting exciting. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? All we're going to do now is a few quick stretch and folds, and then we're going to repeat. So I'm going to just get my fingers under here, kind of pull it away. Uh, as I'm doing this, uh, I'll mention that this is the way that bread used to be made before power mixers. Uh, they would mix the ingredients. Look at the air bubbles in there. Isn't that gorgeous? And this just feels amazing. The, the, look how, how soft and how supple. This just stretches. And as you do the stretch and folds, you'll, um, you'll feel this changing quickly. Uh, anyway, they, they, before the advent of the Hobart mixer, they would put all, mix all their ingredients in a wooden tub or vat, commercial bakeries would. And um, this is the same procedure, but they do it with, obviously, larger volumes of material. Uh, they didn't, you know, power mix or knead 100 loaves of bread at a time. They let the dough do its own work. And you see, already, I've done like four stretch and folds. <laughs> Look how much that's already changed, just that quick. Um, we're not squeezing the air out. We're just kind of being very gentle with it. And uh, there it is. We're ready to let that rest another half hour. The time now is 9.10, and we're going to have another look at this. It's been another half hour. Isn't that beautiful? Look how, how delicate this is. You feel this right after a rest. There's a lot of air in it. There's a lot of bubbles. And as we go on, we want to maintain those bubbles if you like a bread that has an open crumb. The crumb is the part inside the crust by the way. You have crust and crumb. I like big holes. So these bubbles are what create those holes. We don't want to squeeze them all out. So I'm just going to again do, let me pick this up and look at how 
how oh, that's just stretching on its own. See, it's a little bit sticky. This is okay. This is good. I'm going to do that about four times. And you're going to lose air when you do this. It's part of it. But try not to just squash the heck out of it. You just want to kind of gently fold it over, stretch and fold. And you'll notice I'm turning at 90 degrees each time. See, it's tightening up that fast. That's three stretches and folds. I'm going to try to get it to do one more, but if you pay attention to your dough, it'll tell you what's going on with it. That's it's tough now. It's uh, it's it's done. It's it doesn't want to be stretched anymore. So there we go. And we're going to let it rest again. We are now doing the third stretch and fold. Look at how much that rose. It's actually touched the <laughs> touched the top of the bowl here. Um, this is doing really well. It's the same thing you've been doing, so I don't even need to talk you through it at this point. You should be getting really good at this. Should have some background music going here though. I could hum, but <laughs> it probably wouldn't be a good idea. That's actually enough. You saw how how much that was uh resisting me already. That baby is doing so well. So let's see what we have now. It is 10.10 a.m. Um, it's doing incredibly well. Now, I've done three rest periods followed by stretches and folds. You could go four. You could let the, uh, the, the uh, rest times last longer if you want. Everything you do has an impact on the loaf. And even if you do everything exactly the same over and over again, the loaves come out different depending on humidity, temperature, outdoors, things that are going on around. It's, it's, um, it's very sensitive, but the variations are interesting and rarely disastrous. Um, as I mentioned, I like to weigh my water and flour especially. Be, and the flour is the main thing because um, it can have varying amounts of moisture in it and the moisture to flour ratio is what is so critical in getting a, a, a wheat gluten formation that's really going to do what you want it to do. So anyway, we're going to uh, form up the loaf now and this is, this is critical. Um, and there are hundreds of different ways to do this. If you go online and, uh, and search on the, on the internet, uh, and YouTube, you will see many, many, many options depending on what you want to end up with. We're going to do just a real basic kind of a Italian freeform loaf here. You could even use a bread pan. Uh, baguettes are another common one. You can do dinner rolls. But the biggest thing is that no matter, no matter what you do for a loaf, you have to stretch what is referred to as a gluten shield around, um, around your loaf. This is what keeps the thing from just going out sideways, because it, it's still growing, of course. And what you want to do now is guide that growth. In, in the way you want it. You want to guide it into a nice, beautiful loaf of bread. I put quite a bit of flour down here now. 
And now we're not mixing the flour into the dough. That's really important. But this flour now is going to become incorporated into the crust for the most part. But this is what makes this sticky thing here easier to handle. And it also toughens up the outside, toughens up that gluten shield a little bit. Because again, you know, now we, we really don't want to be squeezing any of the air out of this. We want to capture as much of that, those bubbles and that air as we possibly can. So I'm going to very gently let this find its way out of the bowl. Isn't this exciting? There it is. Look at that. Look at that. All right. Now, I'm going to stretch it out here, and I'm going to work on the floured surfaces as much as possible. I keep a, um, a pastry scraper here in case it does start getting sticky, but ideally shouldn't have to use that. So I'm going to gently stretch this out. And then I'm going to start folding it in. And what I'm doing is I'm grabbing at the back here and I'm just pulling and rolling. Okay, Very sticky on the inside. That's to your advantage right now because you're going to seal the ends. Pull the ends in. Pull the end in. See, I'm just kind of very tacky. I'm going to pull this around and meet up in the middle. There we go. creating a, a package. You're encasing the dough in a stretched out gluten shield here. Now I'm going to pinch this together a little bit. And as you pinch it, the moisture works out of the, the flour and kind of makes it sticky again. This one isn't critical, the next one is. So now we're going to do that again. I'm going to make sure I haven't stuck to the counter. I haven't. Now, if you don't have a nice granite counter, uh, before we had this granite counter, I used a, a beautiful wood breadboard that my friend made for me years ago. Um, and that works too. So now I'm going to start again. Now this time, it's going to be a little bit more involved. Plus, the stretch is a lot tighter. Look at, look at how that, see that? It's that gluten shield. And I'm just going to keep on working this in. And pinching as I go. And you're trying to preserve as much of those air bubbles as possible. Some of them you're not going to be able to save. If they're right on the surface, you're going to break them. And life goes on. But you don't want to squeeze the air. It's actually it's CO2 is what's in there because that's what, uh, what yeast exhales as it devours the sugars in your, uh, in your dough. around the end, seal that end again, pinch this together really good. This is probably the most challenging part of the whole process for me, because getting this to stick together and hang together and do this in a way that doesn't damage what's already been done. You don't want to tear that gluten shield, because it's a, it's a balloon. Is, is what you're really doing. You're, you're making a dough balloon um, out, of your, out of your dough. And uh, you want that balloon to hold air, of course, right? To hold that CO2 in there. Okay. It's not the prettiest loaf I ever made, but uh, I've made worse, I guarantee it. Now, that seam, I'm going to flip this over. Make that nice and there we go. Now I'm just going to jiggle this thing around a little bit and kind of try to shape it up a little. There we go. Now at this point, you see, I can pick this up, I can move it gently, of course. Um, you need to decide how you're going to bake this. Now I'm going to do it, I have this, see, I didn't even have to use this, um, which is a good thing, but we'll be using that a little later. I'm going to bake this on a um, on an oven, on a breadstone that I have for my oven. 
you might, at this point, if you were going to use a bread pan, you would just drop this right in the bread pan. Um, or if you're going to use a cookie sheet, put it on the cookie sheet. In my case, I'm going to be cooking it directly on a stone, so I use a wonderful tool. This is old school. If you've ever worked in a pizza parlor or seen somebody doing pizza the old-fashioned way, you know what a peel is. So I'm going to use my bread peel right there. And uh, I'm going to put a little semolina flour on this. Again, this isn't mandatory, but I really like what this does to the bottom of the bread. Kind of uh, lubricates and adds, a, adds another texture. Uh, semolina flour is what is used for uh, making pasta. And it's also what the original, the real Sicilian breads are. Nothing like what we know of as Italian bread. They're very kind of tough and chewy. Um, wonderful breads, of course. Okay, now I'm going to cover this with a cotton towel, which I forgot to bring out. Um, so I'm going to pause the video for a moment. Okay, I'm back with a just a cotton towel here. Cindy found a bunch of these for me, and, and they're great. I don't moisten them. Because right now we actually do want that uh, that gluten shield. We want to keep it flexible enough to where it's going to grow nicely, but we also want it to start drying out a little bit so we get a really good crust. So I'm going to cover this up now, and we are now beginning the process known as proofing. And this takes patience. You can decide how long you think it's going to take, but it's done when it's done, and I will be showing you how to test for doneness. All right, we're checking for proof again. And when you're doing this in real time, it's not going to look as dramatic as what you're seeing here in the videos because you're seeing a time lapse, but this has grown significantly. I'm just going to do the loosen it up thing here again a little bit. It's doing really, really good. And we're going to. It's still not ready. It's getting closer though. You see that? That's that's getting there. The reason proofing is, is so important, getting the timing right, is if you don't proof it enough, when you get it in the oven the oven spring will happen at the same time as the heat is setting the crust. So two things happen. You're limiting the ability of the bread to grow as much as it can. And in order to have a white bread, you want that to happen. The other thing is um, it, it, the, the pressure can actually get so much, so high inside, that it will break the crust around the edges. And if you see a loaf of bread with like a tear out around the edges, that's what causes that is underproofing. Um, I've spent some time at the DIA looking at loaves of bread in art. And that seemed to be a pretty common thing um, many hundreds of years ago for, for that underproofing evidence to be there. But we're getting close. You see those two pokes, they're still kind of there. So right now, I'm going to start preparing the oven. And I think I'm going to get my daughter to film as I'm doing that part of it. All right, welcome to our new kitchen, which uh, if Rob gets to watch this, he's going to be horrified at how much we've already cluttered it. But it's a kitchen in use. We, we live in our kitchen. We love our kitchen. So... What I'm going to do now is get the stove ready. Uh, you just saw that the bread is very close to being proofed. Um, so I'm going to preheat the oven. And the longer you can preheat the oven, the better, because you want a very stable temperature uh, when you get that bread in there. But I want to show you two things I have in my oven. This is, I, I think they call this a pizza stone, a bread stone. It's just kind of a ceramic plate that sits in there. I'm going to heat that up really well, and, and I actually bake the bread di directly on this. Um, so I'm going to, it's going to go off the peel straight onto this, 
and it's going to bake there. The other thing I have going here is this ratty aluminum pan, which does one thing in our world, um, and that is it allows me to steam my bread. The first 15 minutes that the bread's baking, I want a very high moisture content in the oven because that helps the heat transfer and it helps to set up that crust very quickly and cook the crust quicker. If you want a thinner, less chewy crust, you don't use the steam, but this is one of the bakery tricks. They actually have ovens that are made that inject steam and then they can vent the steam. This is my way of doing that. So I, I have this sitting right on the bottom and then what I'll do is I'll pour about a half cup of water in there right when everything's ready to go. One word of advice, and I learned this the hard way with one of my wife's beloved antique Pyrex uh, cooking pans, don't use glass down there because it explodes uh, when you put the water in it. Okay, So, I have that set. Now I'm going to start preheating here. I am not going to use, this oven does convection, and I've already had heartbreak over that. I'm still learning to do that. I know it can be done, but I know with a stone, convection doesn't really work because you don't have air circulation on the bottom, right? So I'm going to hit bake here. I'm going to set this at 450, and I'm going to preheat this to 450 degrees. That's about that. I'm going to get a cup of water sitting off to the side, and... Um, Let's let's walk over here now. Since I have a camera person, I'm gonna I'm gonna check the loaf now again. And uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna let that sit probably another ten or fifteen minutes. It's very close, very close. All right, welcome back to our kitchen. Um, we're ready to rock here. Uh, I just wanted to point out a couple more things here. Oh, one actually. This is just a little atomizer spray bottle with uh, just water in it on a real fine spray. We're going to use that. And then this is a lovely tool called, I think it's pronounced lame. It's a French word, L-A-M-E. It's not lame. It's very not lame. It's actually really useful. Um, what it does is hold a double-edged razor blade so you can use it and not, uh, not slice your fingers open and bleed all over your bread, which would probably make the presentation a little less less um, inspiring. Hey, yeah, so what I'm going to do now is, uh, first of all, let's just show you here. See how that's just kind of sitting there? That that's I m might be able to let this go another five minutes or so, but uh, that that's, that's pretty done. So now, I'm going to drop this in, and I'm actually going to cut... But the main thing I'm doing is slicing the gluten shield, but I want to get it down far enough so that something else interesting happens. The perfect loaf of bread has what we call ears, um, and that means the crust actually lifts off the crumb a little bit along the cut. This cut allows that oven spring to open up and spread out even after the crust is set up, so it helps the bread lighten up. And, and it adds interest. You can do all sorts of different things. I'm going to do just a straight cut. Uh, sometimes I will do a series of diagonals, or on holidays I'll actually do kind of a fleur-de-lis pattern, because if you do that, they open up. It's, it's really pretty. You can do all sorts of different things. But we're going to just lay this in and see, bold, just one stroke straight through. There it is. Okay, now... And I should have done this first, but I'm just going to very gently make sure that my loaf can move freely. There we go. All right. There it is. Now, I'm going to take my, my spray bottle. And uh, don't overdo it. You just want to get some moisture on there, okay? Now, I forgot to clean the counter before I put the... Uh, the peel down. That's not going to work in my favor, but uh, temperature, it's been up to temperature for a bit. <clears throat> Again, bold moves. If you're timid using a peel, it's kind of like being timid flipping an egg in a frying pan. Uh, it, you, you're going to lose unless you're bold about it. So you need to get in there and just, just do it. 
So here we go. I'm probably going to mess this up royally now because I've said that. No pressure. Perfect. Done. Now, just keep it on there for a minute. Okay, so there she is. We're going to take about a half cup of water and pour it into my preheated pan that's flashing into steam. Now I'm going to set my kitchen timer for 15 minutes. I should probably, uh, this is new, I'm still learning this. Okay, enter 15, oh, oh, that's not 15 hours. Nope. Okay, and there we go. Now I'm going to let this go at 15 minutes at 450 degrees. And uh, then I'm going to vent the oven. I'm going to take the pan out. There probably won't be any water left in it. Um, but when I open the oven, it's going to let that, that moist air out. And it's moisture from the pan and it's from the bread. And then I'm going to kick the temperature down probably to about 400 degrees. Again, what you do at that point is going to change the way the resulting bread Okay, that was awkwardly worded. Change the results. Um, the lower the temperature and the longer the post-bake, the after the steam portion, the more crisp the crust is going to be. I'm not going for an extremely crisp crust today. Say that three times fast. Um, because uh, our, we're, we're going to be eating this with soup a little bit later on. Uh, my wife is not fond of a really crunchy crust, so I'm going for something a little bit on the softer side, but with enough substance to stand up to being dunked in soup. So this is a purpose, purposefully built loaf of bread here. So there we go. Uh, I'm going to just turn on the light and we'll take a look inside because we should already be seeing some oven spring going on. Look what's happening in there. Um, that is... That is going to continue spreading out and, and rising for probably about five minutes. Again, as the temperature hits 120 degrees, the yeast is dying. You can probably hear it screaming in there. Um, and, uh, and then the CO2, of course, as it's getting hot, continues to expand as well. So uh, that's going to keep growing for eh, probably five, maybe a, a few more minutes than that. And then it's going to be pretty well set. Okay, so we're 10 minutes in, and this loaf isn't going to change anymore. Look how nicely it's filled out. There's a hint of an ear at one point, but I probably could have done a better job of slicing it. I, I may have been a little too timid. Um, no, no fault, no foul, though. This is going to be really good. Again, this bread isn't going to change anymore um, as far as shape and size, but there's a lot more baking to be done. So uh, we're going to come back and look at it again. Uh, when I when I vent it and take the uh, take the temperature down. All right, we're 15 minutes in. So what I'm going to do now is kick the temperature down to 400. That's <laughs> this is a fancy new stove. It's telling me no, wait. It's hotter than that. Yeah, I know. But it's nice that it lets me know. Our old one didn't do that. So now all I'm going to do is vent the oven. It's actually at 450 right now, so it's going to cool it down fairly quickly. You see, I had just about exactly enough water in there. Um, so Don't put that on the Leave that open for a second. Yes, dear, thank you. <laughs> we'll put that in the stainless steel sink, not on our granite countertop. Our up there, whatever. Anyway, take a quick peek in there, just over the top, and, and look at look at how beautiful that is. So yeah, we're 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 having a pretty good pretty good result here. So now we're gonna I'm gonna set this. See, I'm still learning this new stove. If this was our old stove, I'd set it for 30 minutes right now. Set it for 25. I'm gonna go 25 minutes at my daughter's suggestion, because that makes sense. 25 minutes, and okay, and we'll let that hum for a while. But I'm gonna, I, I can't, I can't just leave it alone. I'm gonna be coming back and checking on it. One of the things I'm looking at now is the color of the crust. Um, one thing about the crust in the oven is, is 
no matter where you think you like it, you actually want to bake it a little darker than that. If you bake it to where it looks right in the oven, it's going to be too light. And believe me, a, a more baking is better that, than less baking in most cases. And then when we think it's done, which again, you know, the bread's going to tell us. I'm using the timers, but you kind of learn by experience and just doing it and getting it wrong a few times, frankly. Um, but uh, one of the things you're going to look for is when you pick that loaf up and flip it over, with an oven mitt on, ask me how I know, um, and you tap the bottom, it's going to sound hollow. All right, so it is about noon right now, and we started this whole project. I started putting the ingredients together right around 7 o'clock. So just to give you an idea, this isn't a ton of work, as you can tell by what has been recorded on video. There's long stretches of relaxation, and there's nothing difficult about this. But this isn't something that you're going to accomplish in any short amount of time. You can shortcut the stretches and, um, and do two of them. I've done that from time to time. All right, so this is another feature of our new kitchen, by the way. It's self-cleaning. If you notice, everything just kind of took care of itself in between here. Thank um, you, Mom. So, yeah. So I'm going to pull the bread out. Let's turn on the light, though, so you can see what we're looking at here. By the way, I did kick this oven down to 375. I was watching the loaf, and it was darkening up a little quicker than I wanted. So, you know, we're still learning this oven. I decided to slow it down a little bit. Now I'm going to take the loaf out. See, it's not stuck in the least bit. It's totally free there. I'm going to flip it over. Can you hear that? That's nice. Got a little bit of brown on the bottom. It's hot, if you were wondering. Um, there it is. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's incredibly important, okay? I'm going to put this loaf down on a cooling rack. And no matter how good it smells, no matter how compelling the idea might be about breaking into this fresh out of the oven hot loaf of bread, I'm going to beg you not to do it. The reason is, this bread is still baking. It is still forming the crumb. If you break into this loaf right now, all that steam in there is going to escape all at once. And the crumb will end up having almost a gelatinous texture to it. It's not offensive. Um, and some people even like it. And I, I would say, you know, if you really love hot bread... The, the thing to do is to let this bread cool completely, finish doing what it's doing. Let it turn into a perfect specimen, or as near perfect as we can get it. And then reheat it. When this, this loaf can go back in the oven and in 10 minutes or so uh, be reheated and then it's warm and you don't have that gelatinous quality and it is really, really the way to do it. Uh, in fact, whenever... I bring bread uh, to serve at, uh, at, at church or at relatives' houses. I bake the bread in advance. And, and I might bake it a little bit less, you know, just slightly underbake. And then before we're ready to go, I'll heat the oven up to 375 or so, sometimes 400. Put that loaf back in there just free on the rack, not on the stone. And let it uh, reheat in the oven. And then I wrap it up in a towel and bring it, and it is better than taking it fresh out of the oven and breaking it open. So I have let this sit long enough to be cool. I'm going to now set it on my breadboard. And for the sake of a good photograph, I want to break this bread. But I've been through this before. If I start trying to tear it, it's just going to go, go haywire. So what I'm actually going to do, and by the way, I'm using a good serrated bread knife here, good quality knife. Um, using a lesser knife or a non-serrated knife tends to crush the bread. I'm going to just make a little bit of a cut there. And this may be a disaster, but here we go. I'm just going to tear the bread. Try to do it with 
without crushing it too badly. And there you have it. That is a very nice loaf of bread. I'm going to stop the cam or stop the video now and take a photo, and then we'll pick it right back up. I'll set it on my breadboard. All right, now I'm going to slice. None of this is going to waste. This is my lunch, this corn part here. So, I just want to talk a little bit about what this bread is to me. Um, we actually started trying to bake bread right after we got married. Uh, I come from a Sicilian heritage on my dad's side. My grandmother's bread was always a big part of our family life uh, up until right around 1970 when she got sick and then passed away. And her bread recipe kind of died with her. But uh, let me see how nice that is. Look at that. Look at that. Um, we had instructions, but nobody ever really learned how to make her bread directly from her. And uh, we tried several times with really bad results. A few years ago, I made the decision to learn how to bake bread rather than try to reproduce my grandmother's bread. And that led to a couple years of practice and college textbooks and uh, few failures, but uh, it's really ended up learning learning how to do it and then went back to my grandmother's recipe with what I had learned about how a dough is supposed to feel and behave and act. And those are the things that you really need to learn hands-on. Um, and if I can do it without somebody taking me by the hand, you, you can do it too. What I've presented you in this video here um, is what I, this is not the way my grandmother made bread, by the way. She rolled up her sleeves and kneaded it, and, uh, but this is, this ends up with a result like my grandmother's bread, which is why I like it. Um, so doing it this way will teach you what you need to know about dough to start experimenting on your own. This is a simple white bread. I will often use, um, use different kinds of flour. I will mix in rye, whole wheat. Um, this was made with a, what's called a strong bread flour, which has a strong gluten content. Um, but I will make this bread just as easily using general all-purpose flour. I don't like to use bleached flours, but uh, the bread that is made with all-purpose flour is actually even lighter and fluffier than this. Uh, the strong flour gives you a little bit denser loaf. But this thing came out great. I'm really pleased with this. I'm really pleased to present it. And uh, please, you know, share your experiences, successes, and failures. Um, I'd love to know that this has been useful to people and that it's maybe encouraged you a little bit to, to uh, take the risk, you know, give it a try. As you've seen, this isn't difficult. I've given you pretty much everything you need to know. And uh, if I can be of any help, I'm glad to answer questions. And uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to do this in person sometime after the outbreak. God bless everybody who is viewing this. Thank you so much. This has been fun. Have a great day.